Today is November 27th, 2017, and Human Factors Cast is back. This is episode 67, and today we're breaking down robot bears, pills that know when you take them, Apple Watch detecting diseases, and more. You don't want to miss today's episode, because uh, we got a lot to catch up on. Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey, we're back from our food comas here in the States. Uh, <laughs> welcome back to Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, and uh, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf is hanging out with me over here. Oh, yeah. Out of the food coma and back for some Human Factors news. Back into the Human Factors coma. <laughs> <laughs> back into the psychosis that is all things human factors yeah so hey thank you to all of our listeners who are uh dealing with our kind of impromptu uh decision to postpone last week's show uh reason being i just kind of wanted to pull back the curtain a little bit here uh reason being is that typically uh Holiday weeks are a little bit slower for Human Factors News, and we kind of suspected that there wouldn't be much to cover. And, you know, Blake and I, are we want to visit our families, too, and hang out and, and do the whole holiday thing. So so we weren't – there wasn't a whole lot of news last week, and we figured that, well, why don't we just take some of the stories from the previous week and, and push them to this week? So that way we have something to talk about. So anyway, that's – Most definitely. That's kind of like what's going on here. But, Blake, what's going on with you, buddy? Oh, man. So enjoy Thanksgiving, and I hope everybody else that did celebrate it uh, enjoyed it as well. Uh, But Nick, man, so my girlfriend's dad, who we spent Thanksgiving with my girlfriend's family, but her dad is a big-time comic book buff. So we went and saw the new Injustice movie, and holy cow, was it so much better than Batman versus Superman. I can't even tell you. So this Uh, is the new, this is the Justice League movie yeah yeah yeah. oh yeah it's called justice league and justice yeah, is the not, game not injustice <laughs> <laughs> anyway but but you uh, liked it yeah i really liked it i mean the cinematics were of course awesome but the storyline was good and there was enough like darkness and humor mixed in there to keep it lighthearted. but something i had never seen before or experienced was this particular movie theater had seats that you could buy that gave off a lot of haptic feedback depending on what was going on in the scenes of the movie. Was this including, uh, like vibrating your seat or like moving your chair back and forth or right and left or just vibrating based on like big explosion sounds? Was this D-Box? Uh, I think so, yeah. And so, so what about it? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Uh, so this is the funny part. We did not sit in them. But oh. we felt the residual effects from them sitting in the row behind them. <laughs> so every time like something, some big explosion would go off, like my seat would rattle and jerk and jolt. And I couldn't even figure out what was going on. It wasn't until after the movie that they told me, like, oh, it's those seats in front of us that are actually making some of – giving us some of that experience, which I thought was kind of nuts but pretty fun. That's cool. I, yeah, I would – I've never actually tried those myself. I would like to try those someday. Uh, and I – I, uh, you know what? I should do that for Star Wars. I should do that for The Last Jedi when it comes out because I heard that watching, um, <laughs> I heard that watching the, uh, what was it? Force Awakens. I heard that watching Force Awakens in the D box seats was like an extended Star Tours. So I'm in. That's so, yeah, because that's what I thought of because I don't know of many movie theaters except for this particular one where my girlfriend's parents live up in the Bay. Uh, so I'm going to go see it, go see Star Wars. It's in the D-Box seats myself as well. So yeah, there, I have to compare notes. There's a couple of them in San Diego. Maybe maybe we could go together. That yeah. would be fun. Let's do it. Let's let's do it. Let's make it happen. <laughs> Why not? All right, man. So before we jump into the news, I got I to gotta talk about net neutrality because this thing, uh, like we don't talk a whole lot of politics on the show, but this thing is really important. Yeah, this could change the face of the way we experience our internet freedoms that and i mean it has huge implications even for something like a podcast right so it's relevant to us it's relevant to our listeners you guys who are listening right now it's relevant to you if you're not familiar with the concept of net neutrality it's basically that um everything on the net is neutral and free and there's no regulations uh or or very minor regulations and that you know child pornography and and all the bad stuff gets regulated but for the most part Small businesses can flourish because there are no sort of um, limits on what 
can, uh, you know, what a service provider, internet service provider can can do. But if this bill that goes through, it's expected to pass, uh, this is in the States. Uh, and I know some countries already have this type of concept where, uh, think of it like cable, right? So um, internet service providers that are owned by these media corporations can say, oh, well, if you want to if you want to search the internet, you can use Yahoo or Bing for free because we own those. Uh, but if you want if you want to use Google, you have to pay an extra premium to um, to to search through Google. And like j- that's that's probably the most dramatic example that I've seen. But I mean, even as something as simple as podcasting, you know, we post all of ours through SoundCloud. But that means whoever owns SoundCloud or whatever ISPs. Um, you know, pr- will offer SoundCloud for free or whatever. That affects us, and it affects you guys too. You know, they might regulate um, even RSS feeds and what you download through. So it's it has a lot of implications. And if you're not familiar with net neutrality, I encourage you to go and call someone that matters and tell them, no, this is not okay. Don't don't let net neutrality die. Uh, it, because it is a really, really important issue that that we should all tackle together. It's bipartisan. It's not. <laughs> it's not any one side. It's rich people versus poor people, basically. And, and also, uh, too, like if if none of the reasons that Nick gave hit home with you, and there's plenty of them that he's thrown out there, but something to think about is a lot of us use video streaming services. And I mean, this whole idea of making the net basically unneutral is going to make it easier for companies that you pay for your Wi-Fi to slow down your ability to stream, depending on what services you're using, if they're not integrated with that specific company. So if you let, if you don't listen to any, if you don't agree with it for anything but that, I don't care, go try and do something about it. I mean, Twitter's full of a lot of post right now that if you just search net neutrality they've got ways that you can sign petitions or put your phone number in to uh, be like on a wait list that'll call you back when you're online with a congressperson in your area Um, yeah it's it's just it's a really important movement for technology as a whole and just keeping the internet at least in a in the u.s uh open and free kind of how it was created to be i mean battle for the net.com is is one resource you put in your phone number it hooks you up with your local representative after uh, you put in your area code um, and your your zip code, and uh, I mean this is so important. This is this was on the front page of Reddit as soon as it went live the other day. It's going first in our show notes. Like this is very important. Do not let net neutrality die. I cannot stress this enough. Uh, but we are here to talk about human factors. Let me before we jump into the news though. I had to mention net neutrality, but I also don't want to miss out on banter. So this is Cyber Monday. Uh, and Black Friday happened here, uh, you know, just, just this last Friday. Um, I gotta say, Blake, I'm not really that impressed this year with a lot of things. Why is that? Why are you not impressed about? (laughs) So I, okay. So let me tell you a little bit about my experience. So I am in the past, I've used the desktop, uh, website, Amazon, right? I, I do a lot of Amazon shopping and, you know, they've, they've made a lot of changes to where, they have sort of made Black Friday a deals week rather than a deals day. And yeah, I remember that last year. Yeah, and so it's become less and less special to get something on the day, and that's that's not really the part that's that sort of bothers me. It's when I checked on my mobile app. So so this year I checked on my mobile app because uh, my partner and I were just sitting around watching TV, um, and I was checking my mobile app and. You know, I I was like, wow, none of these deals are really all that great, uh, and there's nothing really that I want. And you know, I usually see at least one or two things, and I'm like, oh crap, that was that would have been a good deal. I wish I saw that, or I I wish I knew that was coming up. And I think what happens on the mobile app is that they sort of they they don't show you the sales that are over the sales that you missed out on. And I think this is a really interesting design choice because if you see something desirable that was up, then you go, oh, well, maybe they have something later. But I found myself just checking back every now and then and going, oh, nope, nothing interesting. And I know this was the case because my uh, my partner picked up a DVD or a Blu-ray, I guess, and uh, 
yeah, we still collect physical copies, but it was for a uh, it was it was for one of her siblings. So uh, she picked up a Blu-ray and she wanted me to pick up the same thing. And I go to check on my phone. This is not even five minutes later. The thing sold out, but it doesn't even show up on my phone. So it's like. If they had showed it, though, then I'd be like, oh, well, I got to keep my eye out because there are some really good deals in here and I don't even know what I'm missing out on. So I don't know. It, it just didn't it didn't really sit well with me once I knew what was going on behind the scenes. And, you know, to be fair, someone who just logged in and, and sees what's up, they might just see really crappy deals. But like uh, I, I was a little I was left a little unimpressed. Yeah, it's kind of like a 180 from last year because I and I only remember this because I'm not that big of like a Black Friday or Cyber Monday shopper. But last year I noticed that they had like Canon cameras that were going to be way cut down in price. Um, and actually, I remember the whole week before, like I couldn't buy it at that price, but it told me like, "Hey, Black Friday, you're going to look you out can for this price. Purchase yeah. it for like this." And I felt the same way. Like I checked out some stuff on just today, like on for cyber monday and not a whole lot of like very explicit deals of what's going on besides like specifically amazon products i don't know it's just kind of a different feel this year yeah i don't know what it is but uh just just remember folks design matters especially when uh when it comes to sales so all right should we get into this news stuff let's get into it man all right it's been like 12 minutes already i can't believe we're talking for 12 minutes uh so this is the part of the show all about human factors news this is where we talk about human factors uh this could be anything from medical transportation psychology ai vr whatever it is as long as it relates to the field of human factors it is fair game for us to talk about on this show blake what do we got up first this week all right, so up first to kick it off, we've got some Toyota robots hitting the scene. So Toyota has a new humanoid robot bear that's designed to be helpful and safe, a safe assistant to humans. The robot bear features a so-called master maneuvering system, which is essentially a VR-powered remote operating platform that a human can use to have the THR3 robot mirror its movements. The THR3 is designed to work in an assistant capacity to humans across a wide range of different potential uses, from in-home care to at hospitals or on construction sites, in areas impacted by disasters, and even one day there's hopes that it'll help us out in the far reaches of outer space. And if so, when if we ever need to defend ourselves against interdimensional kaiju invaders, at least we have a path to make that happen. Now, Nick, checking out some of the images for this Toyota humanoid robot that they're calling the Toyota Bear, or THR3, this just looks like something straight out of a sci-fi novel. Yeah, should I cue the Pacific Rim theme? Because this is, (laughs) that was the first thing I saw when I saw this, but, um, you know, they've been doing telepresence for a while, and this... I'm curious to see... So you mentioned a couple of the applications in the in the the blurb um disaster relief uh outer space construction sites but i'm i'm really curious to see this in action right so this is so they call it a bear but this is a humanoid robot that one can basically inhabit um through the use of telepresence you basically strap yourself in this suit and it allows you to control this and mirror your movements and you have a VR headset strapped to your face and you can see what it sees. Now, I, I, I have a feeling that this will be used for social interactions where the help of a human, um, y- you want to know that a human is on the other side of this thing and that it's not a robot acting autonomously. And I think that's why they chose to do the human form, right? Because there are so many robots that can do human jobs or that can do jobs more efficiently than humans if it's not in human form. And I tend to think that that is why they chose to go with this human analog form is for the social interaction, right? I can see it in construction sites where, uh, let's say you have a foreman who is, um, you know, telepre- uh, telecommuting between multiple sites and they're just there to check up. And so, but they have robots on site at any of these locations uh, and they just basically strap into the robot and then switch locations, right? And then... They're able to just switch sites just like that, but they still need some sort of human interaction with somebody. If they need to show somebody how um, how sort of this uh, this piece needs to go over here or something, you know, I don't know. But that's that's kind of where I'm at with this. I, I'm curious to see what you think. 
Yeah. Okay. So I thought this was an interesting design, and I think the humanoid, like you sense, like you said, from the social aspect, makes a lot of sense. But also, too, if you look the look at the like almost giant looking throne that they have the <laughs> human sit in with the headset on, and then the kind of like they're basically it looks almost like kind of exoskeleton arms that are allowing you to still make arm movements um, to move the robot. And I feel like that you're right. It's a lot of these are places where either people are going to interact with other humans. And so that it's, it does make people a little more comfortable to interact with a humanoid esque robot, but also too, it sounds like a lot of these uh, zones they have this for, are for like construction sites when, and they also meant mention mentioned like impacted by disasters. So these are places that it might be a little bit dangerous to have humans working, or maybe they're trying to uh, cut down on the amount of like actual humans there. But this robot would allow people to m- maneuver the maneuver the actual robot from a teller operated place, but in a natural action because they're able to like see and understand the body movements and how the uh, limbs function similarly to how they would with their own body. Uh, but like you said, I want to see this thing in action as far as like in home care or even in just hospitals itself to see what the true benefit is here. Cause again, we've designed something that's, of the human body and it's only one human i think moving one robot so in some of these instances i question why they need to replace the human well i i think it comes down to telepresence right because otherwise you wouldn't need to uh or potentially if you're you know operating human in a dangerous situation but still need um them to do the job you know like if you're in outer space and you don't want to strap them into a suit that could potentially fail you can use a robot that has the human form if you're operating construction around something that's really dangerous um you can still use a human form uh but i i don't know i i would imagine there's that but then i i always come back to but there are robots that will do it better so, I don't know. It's it's a tough tough call for me, but I think it's really cool. Have you seen the video? Did you see the video? Yeah, I have. And I mean, the, <laughs> the interaction is just insane. I think it's a great like design by Toyota for sure. Yeah, and uh, the the thing that was really interested or interesting to me is that they uh, they have um, this. Uh, I guess it's kind of like connect reading body movements. So you don't even have to strap yourself into this whole uh, system. It can actually mimic your own move movements just by a camera. So that's, that's kind of cool too. Um, but yeah, I don't really have too much more to say on this other than cool. I can't wait to see the application and uh, I, I want one, I guess. The, the, let me tell you like just a quick side story. I've always like kind of dreamed this is, really weird and please stop me if this gets too far off the rails Blake (laughs) but I've always dreamed of having like my own personal uh, robot kind of like this in the sense that if I could look through a robot's eyes at my own back and scratch my own back uh, that would be amazing and I could (laughs) do it with something like this that's pretty I mean it's pretty awesome I think a lot of us would would find it entertaining in some ways, but also very cool to interact through a robot in a virtual, like using virtual environment technology, but also just like how it would feel to basically manipulate the space you live in through a different body is pretty much the only way I can think to describe it. So, I mean, no, I mean, I, I would love to be an operator for one of these. Um, if, if like it ever came down to that, I had a reason to be, whether it was like designing part of the software or maybe some of the haptics you feel when you're using a, a robot form like this. It's just a, it's an awesome chance, I think, too, for human factors people to get in to not only just the robot technology, but maybe some of the, the extra parts that come with it. So like the building on maybe deep learning a- algorithms that may be integrated or AI that might be integrated. Uh, it's just a, it's a cool space. Yeah, I agree. All right, what do we got up next? Oh, man, this one kind of blew my mind, and it's a it's a pretty interesting story. So, for the first time ever, the Food and Drug Administration has approved a pill with sensors inside to inform doctors how often a drug has been taken. The pill works by transmitting information from internal sensors to a wearable patch 
which then forwards that data to a smartphone app or to caregivers and physicians monitoring their patient's progress. The pill basically generates an electrical signal when it splashes with stomach acid and contains copper, magnesium, and silicone, which are noted as safe ingredients that are found in foods. And patients also have to sign a consent form before any data is actually shared. So, Nick, this... This one is definitely a story that fills me with, oh, this is really awesome. These are huge advances in healthcare, but there seems like some scary ramifications that come with it. I think and so. And a lot of this is all like based around the data that can be transmitted. Yeah, but I'm thinking about the application here. So think about the, um, the elderly individual who has memory problems and they don't remember whether or not they've taken a pill today. And, you know, we've seen this where elderly individuals will overdose because they think they are taking the right dosage, but really they've already taken the pill for the day and now they're taking more. And, uh, this, I I mean, this will help with one way with that, right? So you'll get the elderly individual. Oh, I need to take my pills. Great. And then, um, but if they get trained on it, then they'll know, Oh, I only take my pills when I hear this, take your pill thing. Uh, and you know, if they didn't hear it, and and the 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 whole device that senses this pill being taken doesn't register. You know what I'm saying, right? Like the, yeah, this is actually, this that's is a one way really important application for this, right? Like because I think a lot of this article really focuses on the transmission of that data. Um, but what about people like you're talking about, like the elderly? Like, is this wearable patch giving you any extra data about like, hey, you already took that today. You don't need to take it again. I mean, I know it wouldn't be able to necessarily say that because yeah. it's, it's only but upon I, ingestion. I, um, but that's a, that's a, like a, an interface type improvement, though. Yeah, I do think, though, it does help with one side of it, right? And so, so part of this comes back to training, right? You train the people with memory problems to uh, take it when the computer prompts you to. And then once you take it, this device will then provide some sort of receipt to the system that says, okay, they've taken it. I don't need to remind them anymore. But if they continuously get reminders throughout the day, right, take your pill, take your pill, take your pill, then they know, oh, I haven't taken it yet. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, it's that receipt part of it that says, look, I've taken this thing and okay, system, stop bothering me. That's, that's the exciting part to me is because, uh, you know, if you train them the right way, then they'll never take a pill when they're not prompted to. Um, and so something like this could be really beneficial to that demographic. Oh, yeah. Well, I think it has a lot of potentials to benefit just medicine practice in general. I agree. Because so often we're, we're kind of dealing with the fact that you're ta- if you're taking a medication and you're taking it consistently and you go back to the doctor and it's like, hey, I really haven't seen any change. Well, now the doctor knows that for sure you've been following what was prescribed. So maybe we do need to change something. Maybe you, maybe because of your biology, this is a specific instance where you're the outlier that that this medication doesn't work for, or can we change the dose and watch how that, if that changes in your symptoms over a shorter span of time. I don't know. I think it gives a lot more information to the doctor about how their like diagnosis and prescriptions are being used. Uh, And I think the article also mentions to the, the ability to, you know, see if a prescription's being abused. So let's say if you got pain medication and people don't use them right away, right. well, they're used a bunch of some time down the line in higher quantities, right? You could have that doctor would then have some cognizance to say like, oh, need to watch out for this next time they come in. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or even if they're taking it on time on a certain schedule, right? Like when I got my appendix removed, I was supposed to take pills, antibiotics every uh, eight hours or something. And, and to, to sort of monitor that and to see if that information comes back to the hospital. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's about the feedback loop for me because if you are talking with somebody who's uh, potentially an at-risk um, demographic or, or somebody who may not be uh, fully there, right, after surgery or something, you're, you still got all these chemicals around in your brain and uh, painkillers just messing with your ability to cognitively think about anything and so uh to be able to get that feedback loop going i i'm thinking even for something mundane too like taking vitamins right if they put these things in vitamins and did i take my vitamins today i mean you can there's organization tools that you can do to to remember but but uh you know or or even kind of like a a receipt of 
well, I've taken two of these today and it's every four hours and you can track how frequently you take them. I don't know. I, I just, I, there are a lot of applications that I can think of, uh, but this is exciting to me. I like this. Yeah, I think it ties in really well too with a story we'll talk about later on if if comp- if this kind of works out in a in this trial period because I know in the article the FDA says that this really hasn't shown to enhance anybody taking like being more diligent about taking their pills, but I feel like if this is integrated into like with health apps or health wearables like Fitbits and Apple Watches, um, you, you could see a lot of benefit from it, like reminding people to to take vitamins, like you're saying, or if they're taking specific supplements or even analyze how those supplements or vitamins are taking is interacting with their biology and maybe making suggestions based off of that. So I think it's got a lot of cool implications. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I completely agree. There's some dark side here. Do you want to do you want to talk about the the dark? Yeah, this, this, uh, this is like a really interesting take to me. Um and of course, I think it's it's smart to always think about these things. Uh, it's just it's a little bit super dark, right? That's so, really dark. That's why I wanted to get into it. <laughs> yeah, it's a so imagine the the big part about this is from the la- last line in the blurb is that you have to sign away before your data can be shared by anybody. But we all know that big data is a is also a big business, and so they they sell. Date, they sell your data in like small or copies to other people like advertisement agencies and in this case maybe even your insurance company so here's a dark the dark side i pulled out from the article well really, really quick kind of, really quick yeah. we're talking we do have listeners in in uh, other countries other than usa and so uh this is this is a usa problem <laughs> with the healthcare system here uh and yeah and other yeah. countries with the same issues but there are countries where this wouldn't be an issue, but but continue, continue. Let's... Yeah, I, I still think the collection of data from these sensors might be an issue still, so it might be relevant, something to think about at least. But yeah. yeah, this is very much applied to the FDA and the way our insurance companies work. But imagine, so advertisers of drugs like antidepressants, weight loss pills, or STD treatments, or even your insurance company were mar- monitoring how strictly you followed your treatment res- res- regimens. Sorry. Uh, and then they could use that kind of information against you. So in the case of the insurance company, if they notice that you're you're not taking specific medications that you've been prescribed, let's say for workers' comp, if you're not taking, um, you know, pain medication regularly, what if they could jack up your premiums? Or uh, there's just a lot of different ways the data could be used almost to hurt you um, or make somebody else money potentially. Yeah, yeah. But let's let's... There's the light side too. There's always going to be the the good and the bad with every application, and it's up to us as human beings to not be total jerks about it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, it's up to human factors, practitioners, people to design products, your managers, and just companies in general to make smart decisions about what you're doing with uh, the products you build. Do the right thing. We could we could put these sensors in loot boxes, and then, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even not even going to get into that. All right, let's go ahead and get on to the next story. Okay, this story this story is kind of tough for me. I won't lie, uh, but All right. so here we go. So body cameras have been seen as an elegant solution to the complex problem of police brutality, but a new survey of 75 police departments across the U.S. found that policing policies governing them have as a whole failed. The most failure concerns protections against biometric technology. Only seven of 75 specific 75 departments specifically prohibit the use of biometric technology like facial recognition with body camera footage, which is a serious threat to privacy. So imagine if these, if facial recognition becomes part of body camera technology, simply walking past an officer means you'll be checked against a database, even if you're not really suspected of a crime. So Nick, I honestly had no idea that there was uh it was like a to be integrated thing of facial recognition technology into these kind of body cams. So that's a whole, it's like a exciting and scary at the same time that the algorithms are there, but the, uh, the use of it might be problematic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so this kind of ties back to, um, Ron Davis's chat, right. At, at HFES this year, the, uh, to me, it's it's the same thing as adding on uh, something to a system that's already broken, right? Like the facial recognition, fine, um, the, but I, it's on a system that's already broken, and so how? <laughs> it, it's not going to work. It's not. 
the facial recognition thing is not going to work. Uh, they're still going to the 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 point of this article is that um, there is a failure to protect civil rights, and it's because of the the policy. It's not because of the technology. And yeah, I mean, and I feel like we've brought this up a bunch of times, but I've this is just like another really good illustration of the fact that technology isn't going to solve the problems in a lot of these bigger spaces like policing or um, one that I can think of is like metropolitan transportation. Like it's, it's a lot of it comes down to the rules and the regulations and like a change of how uh, all of this stuff is run um, from a right. high level versus just, Hey, here's technology, use it and it'll make things better. Yeah. And I think there's an important distinction. There are people that work on, um, the human factors of these smaller systems. And that's not to uh, say that those are less important than the larger systems. They're just different problems. Um, and no one thing is going to solve it all. Right. It, it, and it's like, we all have to work together interdisciplinary to solve these problems. And this is just one more example of the technology may work as intended, but the system that it's based on is rooted in in uh, a system that does not favor per certain individuals you know it's it's just a it's crappy man like i hate it <laughs> and i i hate that we just keep trying to throw technology at this thing and 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 hope that it works um and you know it all comes back to the fact that we have to think about things at a system of systems level you know where where you have the system of you know, tasers, whole uh, body camera ecosystem. But then you also have the system of uh, criminal justice and and how do those interact with each other? Well, you know, they complement each other only as much as um, the taser tools enable the police officers to enforce the system that is in place already. Like it's it's go back and listen to that coverage of HFES 2017 if you haven't because that talk was just something else man like and and this that just that's the whole reason why I pulled this article is just ringing in my head the entire time yeah and i mean it's a great callback to it as well i think that i think there is and trust me i know that there from the headline itself that these are a nationwide failure to protect civil rights. I get how bad that is, but I, I feel like the more that stuff like stories like this come out, the better chance we have to really tackle the policies behind it. Yeah, I would hope so. Yeah. And hopefully that it also illuminates other problems. Where we're trying to just throw technology at the issue where we need to think of the system from, like you said, a systems of systems approach and really get down to what the organizational structure needs to be and how things need to interact and what checks and balances need to be in place and then how to integrate the technology. I mean, it's, it's similar to, I think a, a lot of what I've worked on in the past, but I, I also think we're at a point where we are so focused on the technology and innovation and not enough on like what it means once it's introduced, but more so like just shipping that technology. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. We need we need change. We need change. I, dude, I don't want to talk politics at all on this show, but it's really hard to like skirt it because like this, this and the FDA and the healthcare and then the net neutrality thing. This is a pretty politically charged episode. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's again that whole the systems perspective, right? Of yeah. like we're integrating technology and we're we're human factors practitioners, and that stuff's interesting to us, but there's so much more to be done for it to be effective, right? Yeah, it really is. All right. Uh, before we move on to the next story, I just want to thank all of our friends over at TechCrunch and Gizmodo for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can follow all of our social media for links to those original articles, and we post those as we find them. Sometimes we even throw uh, little special links in our Slack, which you can join. It's in our show notes on our website, wherever you can find us. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? So, Nick, this is a crazy take on VR that I – and it just illuminated so many things that I wasn't aware of as far as the market. Let's but anyway, break it down. so there's some sad news on our VR front, and it looks like the HTC, HTC and Google have both confirmed to TechCrunch that the Daydream branded HTC standalone headset will no longer be coming to the U.S. market. This news comes, of course, after Facebook 
Facebook's Oculus announced that the Oculus Go will be a $200 standalone headset capable of playing stationary mobile titles from the Gear VR store. This move is driving Western market market competition, making it difficult for other companies to really make money off of their hardware releases. Beyond the Vive headset, Google Google has announced that they are working with Lenovo on a, another wireless daydream headset, and they've confirmed that they will be releasing the product with Lenovo later this year. Well, there's not a whole lot of time left, Google, to be releasing stuff, but holidays are coming. Yeah. So, there. Okay. So at the surface, this sounds like. Uh, just that they canceled their VR headset. But I want to get into the implications. So the reason they gave was that... Uh, uh, it, shoot, where is it? It's uh, that they it, they couldn't be competitive with Oculus Go, right? That's the reason they gave. Yeah, because Oculus, from their standpoint, they're really not trying to make money from hardware. Um, so they they've, like, I think they mentioned in the in the post that they they've cut the prices pretty dramatically and it's forced everybody else to follow. But pe- even though HTC was HTC was like with the first on the market with the vibe, they do, they did have it in their business model to make money off of hardware sales. Right. And, and it comes down to Oculus banking on content. They are going to make their money back in content. And it's, it's a very similar model to how, the video game industry works right where you have uh, Microsoft, Sony and Nintendo selling the consoles at a steep discount because they're expecting to make that back and then some on the software that they sell for it. That's just the video games Um, because they get a slice of that. And so uh, they're, they're banking on, you know, to get those sales back in another way. And I feel that Oculus is using a similar strategy here. And it's sad that, um, you know, Google and HTC can't keep up with this, but it also has huge implications for the VR market. Uh, if we have one company who is trying to dominate based on content, then that's not healthy for uh, this sort of competition of making a better portable VR headset. And and the big sort of, um, or the, the key piece of this is that it's the portable aspect of it right so so these are the headsets that you could potentially just carry with you in a little box and then if you um had an application to where you you wanted to use it you could basically put it on your head and be be good to go and uh you know a lot of the the complications with vr systems right now is the setup right you have to set it up and and um there's the cables and everything but this is from what i understand a standalone thing where you just toss it on your head and it's self-powered there's no cables no nothing uh and you're good to go and so the the fact that you know htc and google are backing out of this well what does that mean for the industry does that mean vr is dead well no i don't think so but it does mean that uh, and this is a little exciting for me is that oculus is is focusing more on content which is honestly what vr needs right now and um you know, hopefully there will be a day when HTC and Google realize that as well and, and they start to get in on the content side of things and are able to discount their headset to a competitive price uh, that will, you know, allow competition and also drive innovation within uh, the field. So I I have a lot of thoughts about this and, and those are kind of the gist of them. Um, but I pulled this just because it, it has implications for... Uh, the advancement of technology, especially when it comes to competition between um, competitors. Yeah, I thought it was a really interesting piece. And uh, maybe we want to really look into, you know, how global economics work. Because one one thing that I that I've left out of the blurb is although HTC is dropping the Western bound version of this Daydream branded standalone, they're still pushing. Um, a separate standalone in China because for them, actually the Chinese market for VR and content developers is that's where they're really honing in their skills. I mean, right. where they're, where they're kind of losing out to Oculus in the States or in the Western world, the uh, China is really, really taken off for HTC. And the reason that they're really pushing, like dropping the, the Google uh, branded, headset and moving forward with the one in China is because they do want to continue to give people um, a place to develop content and build more stuff for their platforms. I think they just don't have as big of a 
um, content developer base in the Western world than they do in the East and in China right now. So I feel like they're just chasing their actual market where they have the chance to actually make the money and build content. So I think it makes a lot of sense. It's just it is kind of a bummer as far as competition here in the States. Yeah, but I mean, we'll we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, it, it is it it it's unfortunate, but it's also uh, the implications for the field too. So I don't know. I'm kind of I'm kind of fifty fifty lukewarm on it. It's just one of those kind of statusy things. Here's what's going on, um, and let's comment on it. But uh, let's get into the next story. This one seems a little more interesting to me. Yes, this one's super fun. Okay, so a new study from a startup called Cardiogram suggests that wearables like Apple Watch, Fitbit, and others are able to accurately detect common but serious conditions like hypertension and sleep apnea. Cardiogram previously demonstrated the ability for the Apple Watch to detect abnormal heart rhythm at with a 97% accuracy. That is insanely high. This... This new study, however, shows that the watch can detect sleep apnea at a 90% accuracy and hypertension with an 82% accuracy. Now, again, Nick, this is kind of what I was alluding to earlier where I was talking about some kind of integration with these kind of wearable technologies with uh, kind of like pill sensors would be an awesome game changer for the health community. Yeah, I completely agree. And uh, the fact that uh, these devices that we slap on our wrists are now able to detect some of these more advanced uh, conditions. Like this is this is amazing news. Like I, I think, um, you know, I I'm really interested in an in artificial intelligence and how it can improve how we diagnose uh, health conditions or or uh, how it can improve our lives just from analyzing patterns. And this is another one of those uh, instances where I'm just pretty astounded by what we're able to do with just a simple sensor and some yeah data. and to think that all it's really doing is checking your heart rate yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's crazy it's just such a simple thing that all you all you have to really do is wear it i mean fitbits have gotten to be rel- very inexpensive and in, like if if in comparison to like apple watch or whatever so i mean this is just a, a great thing to have to help just to help you with your own health and give your doctor a better insight into what's going on with your body uh, outside of those snapshots where you go to the doctor and they check your blood levels or heart rate and don't see anything wrong. Well, maybe over time they could see something's wrong. Yeah. I mean, I feel like what earlier this year we talked about uh, Apple watch detecting uh, abnormal um, heartbeat. Is that, is that what it was? I forget what it was, but we talked about another study or another, uh, thing earlier this this year and it feels like this is just that next level of okay well we've detected abnormal um heartbeat patterns and now we're able to based on those abnormal or abnormalities we're able to even uh split it down even further and here are two more things that we can detect and that is really exciting to me because the more data that we have the more accurately we are able to assess this data uh you know it, it's going to help a lot of people most definitely. And yeah, you're right. It, I think this article actually mentions it too. It too. The, the other study was the abnormal heart rhythm. Um, and again, it, it comes down to, okay, what other patterns can we determine from people's heart, heart rates over time? Um, and I think the, the part that really got me excited about this article was not only that, again, we're seeing a way that we can detect diseases potentially earlier than we might be able to or before things get to a critical state. Yeah. But also this particular study like got really deep into, okay, how is our learning algorithm doing that we're using? And they use a learning algorithm that they call DPART. And in the study, which was around like 1600 people, uh, what they did was actually train the algorithm. So taking data from people to analyze patterns um, from 70% of those participants. And then they fu- they tested the remaining 30% um, that weren't based on data that they had, that the algorithm had already collected. So they weren't like kind of being walked through the process of diagnosing, analyzing. It was more of the deep heart algorithm doing the heavy lifting of identifying patterns like sleep apnea or hypertension risk. Right. All right, man. Do you have anything else to add to this one or... Uh... Are you good? Other than just sounding like a fanboy for it, no. I'm just really excited about what this means for people's personal health care. 
All right, man. Well, I got a little surprise for us. Uh, we we got a we got a voicemail. We got oh, we got a voicemail. We got a voicemail. <laughs> now this is awesome. Now to be fair, this just came in, so I have not listened to this. So <laughs> we'll see. We'll oh see. Oh my! <laughs> but this is uh, this is completely live, live right now on the show. We'll see. We'll see what this is. All right, hang on. Let's see here. Hi, this is Patrick. I'm calling with our holiday cash giveaway oh, cool. in regards to an official contest entry form that was submitted in your name to win $25,000 in cash. The entry may have been submitted at a <laughs> local mall, a studio. restaurant, or an event you may have attended. I have excellent news for you. Your entry has been selected. Yes, Contacting Human Factors Cast is rich! Toll free, 877. Uh, all right. This guy, <laughs> clearly not one of our listeners, uh, but if you guys want to call in... You guys uh, are more than more than welcome to. Ca- oh, they're calling back. That's funny. All right. Uh, well, yeah, you guys can call in. Uh, I'll get that number for you. Just a second. It's a uh, what is it? I say it every day at the end of the show. All right, nine zero one six four six one four three two. That's nine zero one six four six one HFC. If you want to call in and not be like Patrick and tell us that we won money, um, or call in and let us know that we won money, but also ask us human factors related questions, that'd be great. All right, so <laughs> let's get into it. Came from Reddit this week. Uh, <laughs> I'm so bummed. I was hoping it was going to be like a serious too. question. Yeah, me too. Our first voicemail is uh, we we won twenty five thousand dollars. Great jackpot. <laughs> so all let's right. get uh, let's switch gears here. Talk about it came from Reddit. So this is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit. So kind of our community outreach. See what the community is talking about. So any subreddit's fair game as long as it relates to human factors and encourages discussion among the community. Blake, which ones do you want to get into? We got a couple here. We got a lot here. Uh, we do, don't we? Okay, Nick, I'm really going to be honest with you. I'm afraid that we've done one of these, Okay, uh, but I might be have. wrong. Uh, well, I like number one. I know we haven't done number one. Um, okay, let's do number one. Okay, so let me go ahead and read this. This is a little bit long, so I might truncate this a little bit. Uh, the question is, how do you share UX research videos with team slash clients? So this is from user experience, and uh, this is from, hi, I am Steve from Berlin. Um, Steve from Berlin writes, how do you make videos recorded in UX research sessions available accessible to the team client, especially a remote team client? Uh, after a session, they end up with 40 to 50 gigabytes of video material, um, they want to make it accessible. This is a really long one. I'm just truncating here. Uh, and the meta info about the video research method is explained. There are photos, screenshots, uh, and a log to see who else watched the video, what time ranges they saw, and annotations and insights they marked. Okay, so this is an interesting one, Blake. I'm curious to see what you think about this uh, because I've actually struggled with a problem like this in the past. Well, cool. I'm glad you have. So I've I've got like a very split brain way to tackle this, um, and I hope it's useful. I'm not sure that it's going to be, but on outside of like the research, like sharing videos thing, I do some video editing um, with a buddy in L.A. for UXPA L.A. Um, and if this guy is like really looking for a service or anything, something that we found is either like upping your your Google Drive or there is a awesome service called Drop LR um, that allows us to share videos across if you're trying to share stuff in between researchers and they're remotely located, which sounds more like it's your clients that are remotely, lo- remotely located. OK, enough of that. So if you need somewhere to store stuff, definitely check out droplercom It'll help you. They can handle a lot of really big video material and if you need to save it for later. But the thing that I'm a little confused about is, all right, so trust me, I'm a freelancer. I know that people can be demanding as far as what they want from you. And if they want the videos from you, fine, cool, awesome, give them to him. But in my opinion, this this part right here, as far as how you share videos with teams and clients, I would more go the route of showing them the stuff that's pertinent. I wouldn't really just like wa- let them watch video after video, drawing kind of, unless you're like working in an integrated team, I mean, you can get yourself stuck down rabbit holes. What I would show them is the clips that are important for that are important for the product right now or important for them to hear, especially if you guys are running into a wall with a particular feature, um, stuff like that. I, I really don't know that it's a great idea just to be sharing the full annotated video with your client, um, with your team. I can see some arguments for that, but with your client, it's just, that's so much information. Um, that's like 
that's like just showing all of, all of your work, but not giving them, you know, the, the high level. This is what I got from all these videos and here are some, some great clips that'll help us make the product better. Um, so Nick, you said you have a little bit of experience with this. What was your take on this? Yeah, I do. So just to give a little bit of background, I was doing usability testing and, um, you know, oftentimes uh, the people who need to see these things want to see the whole thing, but I didn't want them interfering with the uh, usability test, right? So obviously people who don't know what they're doing would come in and say, well, uh, X, Y, Z with leading questions. Um, so what I ended up doing, and I don't know if you have access to something like WebEx, but you're able to record videos and tag at certain times what's going on um but i would present a webex where somebody else could watch it remotely and then type in a question and i'd have the webex up on a screen where the the user could not see and if they had any questions those questions would be fed up through webex while i am uh running these usability studies and um and i would ask them in the moment if i thought it was pertinent to uh, or, or, you know, potentially rephrase what they were saying, but I was acting as the filter to go through. Now, also with distributed teams, I understand that as well. WebEx is a useful tool because, like I said, you can record them, put them up, and then somebody else across the world can go, oh, look at this during this time. Um, and that's something that I did not annotate in the WebEx, and then it's brought to my attention uh, if I search for that person who made the comment and I'm looking for it. I agree with you, Blake, where uh, it's probably best to show a highlight reel of the things that you found. Um, and there are ways to do that effectively where uh, for me, it was like I, I kind of tried to extract themes from these usability tests. And those themes um, would be something that I would edit a video for and say, look here. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It's not like you're delivering a YouTube video on the uh, the extreme sport of uh, usability testing. So I would just say, you know, just put together like a clip of four or five people saying the same thing about whatever you're testing and call it done and say, look, here's what we found. Um, these were the uh, most important comments and then present that to the people who who need it. Don't, don't give them all of the raw data because that's just overwhelming and they're trusting you to do the job of coming up with these conclusions. And if they want to see what the actual users are saying, then that's a perfect Avenue for that. But otherwise, um, you know, I, I don't think you need to send them the full video. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, if, if anything, if they want the full video, if that's in your like contract somewhere, like send them that is like an, a, uh, an attachment thing to yeah. your your main content uh, well but nick that's a great idea about the webex because you're talking about doing it live right yeah 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 and that's that's even more interactive for these people too because if you say like i'm going to be doing this from 10 a.m to 11 a.m and you can ask questions live in the moment and i will be able to you know in the situation that i was in i actually piled all the um all the other people who wanted to even see what was going on uh, with screen sharing and a, a video camera. And, you know, of course we asked for permission from the users if they could be recorded and that we have a team in the other room watching and they might be giving us questions, but I'll be the filter. Um, you know, as long as you let them know that and, and um, pile everyone who's in another room. And it was really great because we actually had uh, some really higher ups in another room that were watching along and it was really informative for them too. So I, I can't recommend that strategy enough. Uh, it seemed to be really valuable, at least for, um, you know, the, the, the company I was working at. And, and um, we never actually sent the videos to clients, but we did do sort of a presentation where we did that kind of highlight reel thing that I talked about. So, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at with it. Yeah. Nice one, Nick. Covered that really well. All right. Good. Thanks. All right. We got time for one more. Let's do three. You want to do three? All right, let's get into it. All right. Uh, this one's titled, Just Joined a Company to Figure Out Why Customers Keep Leaving Ellipses. I think it's due to bad UX. This is also on user experience. This is from uh, UX Design Chobo. Uh, so they write, I was hired at a company because they were having trouble retaining clients. 
uh, business as a website have concluded the UX design is pretty bad. The UX designer in the company seems to be more of a web designer than UX designer. Um, there appears to be no user research findings that justify their design choices and the information architecture is out of control. I want this company to succeed and achieve my goals, which is to prevent clients from leaving. My boss is focused on account management and post-sale care, but I'm 99% probably positive, people aren't engaging with the product because the UX design is bad. How could I approach this with my boss who doesn't seem to know much about UX without starting beef with the UX designers? Okay, Blake, I'm going to let you tackle this one first because this one's, this one's tricky. Yeah, this is a juicy one for sure. Um, yeah, okay, so you're finding yourself kind of an interesting position because you're in the company. So how I would tackle it is probably different than you would, but I'm going to give you the advice and you have to kind of weave it, weave it into you in the way you would be able to put it in there. So be very careful of office politics. If you think somebody is more of a web designer than a UX designer, that's that's okay. Uh, you can always work with the team to make it better. That's why you're there. You're there to help solve the problems. Um, so the focus on... Um, post-care account management, if you think about that, that actually makes a whole lot of sense because now people have converted. You really want to retain them. So it sounds more like to me you're not as much worried about um, retaining them as you are just getting them to convert in the first place. So I would like a lot, I would align with your team and try and figure out really where the problem is. Is it, is it conversion? Is it getting people to even get to your site? Um, something that might be helpful is looking at databases of traffic on your site and similar sites. Uh, there's there's things like, uh, I know Amazon Web Services has Alexa. They have, it's pretty baseline, but that's a good way to look to try and see like, okay, where where's most of my traffic coming from? And that would give you some data that you don't have right now. Um, also too, be be proactive. If you're recognizing right now that, okay, there's there's no information on user research or there's no meaningful metrics that we're cap capturing, uh, talk to your development team, see if they've got Google Analytics running and just get them to pull a dashboard for you and start taking a look at it. I guarantee you they probably have it because um, that's just kind of become a standard. If it's true, you think the information architecture is out of control, um, I would try and fix it. Come up with a proposed solution and kind of really show in a benchmarked way, like why why just changing this going to achieve our goals? And really, that's, again, aligning with your team and understanding, like, okay, what's our problem? Is it, again, conversion, uh, engagement, people getting to the site? Um, and if your your boss is really focused on something, doesn't know much about UX, that's fine. I mean, it's part of your job to really evangelize the process and be very open in talking to your design team or the team you work within about like, hey, what about what about changing the information architecture or, hey, what can we do to really do like a small user test with uh, our product now to try and understand like what's really going on? Um, I think there's a lot of ways you could tackle this with a little inform just a little bit of basic data analytics on the site itself. Yeah. And then trying to build, you got to build a case for the people you're working with. Cause if they've been in the trenches with this thing for however long, maybe they can't look up far enough to, to see the problem. And two, you're going to always run into tough situations where you're going to have to like kind of argue for the user and the cross pollination of what the business goals are. So you just got to kind of navigate that as best you can without like just attacking somebody that's the probably the biggest thing not to do yeah this one's interesting to me because it sounds like they are a designer that got hired to um sort of figure out why they had trouble retaining clients and i am curious as to see whether or not user research is in your repertoire if it's not i would definitely brush up on that and then um y implement some of those strategies to find out like Blake said here, what what is going on and, and what is it that uh, users are finding or, or having trouble with on your website? And I completely echo everything that Blake said. Um, just do your best to kind of elevate your thoughts. Don't feel shy. They hired you for a reason. Um, but also try to navigate the situation best you can to not hurt anybody's feelings and just say, well, hey, look... Um, you know, don't come out and say the design is bad to just say, you know, I think there are ways that um, the users. Well, no, I take that back. Say the design is bad, but don't you say it. Let the users say it. 
So that's that's kind of my two cents. Yeah, or another way to go about it. I mean, there's a line in here that says the information architecture is out of control. Well, how can you phrase that using like meaningful business terms to your your team or whoever else will have to search small research plans or looking at analytics or implementing analytics? Can you propose taking your own ideas and testing it with a random sample of people might give you more in um, yep. and that's doing the things that I think you know to do, but you're you might be scared to do them. Yep. All right, Blake. Uh, if you guys have any suggestions or topics or news stories or whatever you want us to cover, uh, you can head on over. You can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646. They, they speak volumes. Uh, <laughs> be sure to like, subscribe, review us wherever you find podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, whatever it is, favorite podcast directory. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnstrup, thank you for hanging out with me on a Monday night talking about UX and human factors and robots and everything. Where can our listeners find you if they want to engage with you? Uh, such a great way to get back into it, Nick. I think we covered some fun stories. As always, listeners, if you're not in our Human Factors Cast Slack, hop in there. I'm always down to have a chat with you or share some interesting fact I find on AI, hot dogs, whatever. Uh, if you're looking to get in touch with me in a different medium, you can always hit me up on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It depends. It depends. Gene Robotics. Why is the bear a robot? It's a human. It's not a bear.